Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fifth episode of me building my 32 Ford Roadster. Now, in this episode, we're going to cover brake systems. So hold on, because when it comes to your future brake system, a lot of different variables, a lot of different options that you have when it comes to your future hot rod. Now, we're going to start with the heart of the system, which is your master cylinder. Before we get into the specifics of that, however, we need to talk about its location. You have two options. What's most standard or normal on a hot rod is it being chassis mounted. Another option you have is on the firewall. Now again, even though this is more normal, there is some situations we're going to want to consider the firewall. One example is if you're building more of a custom or a land speed car where the chassis is probably best to be really low to the ground, this isn't going to be that accessible, so a firewall might be the best option. Another reason why you might want to consider the firewall, again, for clearance issues, if you can't run your exhaust on the bottom of your chassis and you actually have to run it through your X-frame, that's going to generate a lot of heat right where your master cylinder is at. So you might want to consider putting your master cylinder on the firewall. The downsides of it being on the firewall, it's going to require a little bit more customization when it comes to your pedal assembly. And it's also going to be something else to look at besides your future beautiful motor inside your engine bay. So now that we covered location, we need to cover a power booster. Now, it's not that normal to run power boosters on hot rods. Usually, it's just a full mechanical brake system. The reason why, space. Two, especially if you're running like an old four banger or flathead motor, usually those motors don't provide enough consistent vacuum to actually power that power booster. Now, Again, if you're going to be running that on the firewall, your master cylinder on the firewall, imagine a big old seven, nine inch gold piece round drum on your firewall, taking away all the attention from that small engine bay and your engine. So again, you could run it. It's not completely abnormal, but you'll be fine without running a boosted setup. So now let's talk about master cylinders specifically because this can be a little confusing, a little bit daunting, but it's really that simple. The first thing that you might notice out there is the difference between a single chamber or a dual chamber master cylinder, also known as a single port or a dual port master cylinder. Now, single port is definitely more traditional. That's definitely 100% original. However, the flaw that it has is that if you ever do get any leak in any side of your brake system, your entire brake system is compromised. With the dual port or a dual chamber, you can have an issue with the front and you'll still have your brakes in the rear or vice versa. So it's really more of a safety thing. It's more standard. So I would definitely recommend going with a dual port or a dual chamber system. Now, another thing that may kind of get you going in circles is you'll see some master cylinder setups as disc drum, disc disc, drum drum. Now, what you'll also notice is that when they're marketed that way in the description, it already comes with the built-in proportioning valve and residual valves and the brake switch on that whole little one unit that comes off. What I'm trying to get at here is that a master cylinder is a master cylinder. It doesn't matter whether you're running disc, drums, front, brake, and rear when it comes to a hot rod because your proportioning valve and those residual valves and your brake line switch are all going to be separate anyways. So don't get hung up on whether it's a disc disc, drum drum, whatever it is. We're going to cover that here soon. But here's the actual three things that you need to consider when buying your master cylinder. The first and main thing is the material. Most master cylinders are cast iron. Now cast iron will rust rather quickly, especially when surrounded by a bunch of brake fluid. So make sure that if you do get a cast iron, make sure that you also get the appropriate paint and make sure that it's actual paint that is resistant to brake fluid. The other option you have for material is what I used here, which is aluminum. Of course, aluminum is softer, it's not as strong as actual steel, but for this type of application, you'll be 100% okay. You don't have to worry about any potential rust issues in the future. Now, most master cylinders will actually have ports on both sides of the master cylinder but there are options out there where it's only on one side. So when you're researching your master cylinder, just make sure that your exits, your ports, going to your brake lines are on the appropriate side for your setup. Nothing worse than buying a part you won't use in the future. 
The third thing and the most critical thing when selecting your master cylinder is its bore size. Now there's four different sizes ranging from 7 8 to 1 and 1 8. Now here's the critical thing you need to know. The smaller the bore size, the more pressure. Many people think naturally that the bigger the bore size, bigger is better, bigger means more pressure. It's actually incorrect. We're not going to get into the specifics of volume displacement and all that stuff here, but the smaller the bore size, the better. But here's the thing. You don't just go for the smallest one because more pressure is good, right? You need to take into consideration your pedal ratio. Now you can research on how to calculate your pedal ratio. It's pretty simple. You're just taking two simple measurements and that pedal ratio is what you're going to use to determine your bore size. Because if you use too small of a bore size, too much pressure is going to make your brakes very touchy. Too big of a bore size is going to make your brakes feel really squishy and require a lot more travel to get the same amount of pressure. So what you need to know here is that your pedal needs to match your master cylinder. In order to find that out, you need to know what your actual ratio is, what your bore size needs to be, and whatever the surface area or bore size is, your front and your rear brakes. There's an easy calculation and a formula for that, but again, what I'm trying to accomplish here is that smaller isn't always better, and your pedal and your front and rear brakes are what's gonna determine what bore size you need. Before we continue, I wanna take a quick second to thank you guys. Today is March 16, 2023, and we've reached a critical milestone. It may not seem like a big deal, but it is for me. This channel officially reached 100 subscribers. So if you're one of the people that have watched this entire series, I just want to thank you for your time, and I hope you continue enjoying the content. All right, so now that you've made the selection on your master cylinder and you understand that, there's four more parts that you need besides your master cylinder. The first is a proportion valve. Now what that does is it pretty much changes the amount of fluid that goes to your rear brakes versus your front brakes. Because believe it or not, the majority of your car's stopping power, about 70% or so, is in the front brakes. The back is only about the 30%. I know that's contrary to what many of us kind of learned up thinking, especially riding bicycles, never grab that front brake too hard, right? But on automotives, when you got four tires, majority of that's going to go in the front. Proportion valve is usually really nice, really simple, inlet, outlet, and a knob. And as you turn that knob in, it reduces the amount of pressure in the rear, turn it out, it increases. That's something that you're going to kind of um, adjust and tune once your fully car is built and put on the road. The second and third item are your residual valves. Now, on a disc brake system, sometimes you run those up front, you're going to need a two pound residual valve. And if you're running drum brakes, usually in the rear, myself in the front as well, then I would need two 10 pound residual valves. Again, two pounds for disc brakes, 10 pounds for drum brakes. There really is no other option. You're just gonna route those in line with whatever residual valves appropriate for your brake system. The fourth and last item you'll need for your main kind of brake system is going to be an inline pressure brake switch. There's a few things to consider when buying that switch. The first thing, is at what actual PSI does the switch activate and turn on your tail lights. The second is gonna be what type of connector does it take? Some of them just have built-in bullet connectors. Some have just kind of these standoffs and you have kind of an actual connector that slides in. Some are actual screwed on terminals. Keep that in mind. And of course, the last thing to consider is going to be whether it's an eighth inch NPT, just to match whatever future fittings you're gonna be running. Speaking of fittings, let's get into those. When it comes to brake fittings, you have three different options. Single flare, a double flare, and a bubble flare. The bubble flare is normally reserved for European cars. Those are normally not used on hot rods or American vehicles. So we're gonna focus here on single flares and double flares, but before I tell you the specifics about those, we also need to take into consideration brake lines and the different materials that those come in. Now when it comes to brake line material, you again have three options. The first and most commonly found, I guess, especially at your normal auto parts store, is a steel line. And these steel lines are usually protected by some type of coating to prevent from rust. Second is going to be stainless steel. And third is going to be NICOP 
often also referred to as copper nickel, cooper nickel, you name it. They're not 100% copper. Those are technically legal since a long time ago due to durability issues. So they started putting nickel in them for a little more strength. So again, you have steel, stainless steel, NICOP lines, and you also have normally 3 16th size or quarter inch size. Now, quarter inch is normally used on later models, but a lot of hot rods, a lot of traditional stuff, any pretty much older car, it's totally safe and totally normal to run 3 16th line. So now that you understand what type of fittings and what type of materials there is for brake lines, these two do intermingle. Now, any brake line material can take a single flare AN fitting. Single flare, they're usually a nice little collet for support, for sealing, and then your actual nut. However, if you're gonna be running a double flare, you're not gonna be able to do a double flare on a stainless steel line. That material is way too hard. You're gonna just get a lot of slippage. It's not possible. Double flare is only for true steel or the cooper nickel, copper nickel, NICOP material. So now we can talk about the pluses and minuses between a single flare and a double flare. I'm not going to get into the whole debate of which one seals better. It's all debatable, really. What you need to know is that a single flare is normally used with an AN style fitting, and a double flare is used with an inverted flare fitting. There are pluses and minuses to both. For example, when you're using a single flare, those are really easy to physically make your brake lines with. However, in order to run AN fittings, you're gonna to need to buy adapters for your master cylinder, your residual valves, proportioning valves, and every corner of your brake system. And that could get expensive, especially if you're running stainless steel components. Now, when it comes to the inverted flare fitting, the double flare fitting, all these components already use that double flare. So you're not gonna to need to buy those adapters it's also less components that could in the future leak or fail on you. But again, a little bit more difficult to make and also maintenance, really. So those are the pluses and minuses between the materials, the flares, the fittings. Hopefully you have the information you need to make the decision for your future hot rod. One thing that might help you make your decision on what type of flare you're going to use is that you need to remember that the tool used for a single flare is completely different than for the double flare. You can't just take a double flare tool, do a single flare with it, and run it. It won't work. Reason being is that an AN single flare is at a 37 degree taper, and a double flare is at a 45 degree taper. So both of these need to match up to the fitting that you're actually running. So the other thing to consider is that especially on stainless steel lines, the actual crimping tool that you need for a single flare, it's actually rather expensive, about 200, 250 bucks. However, in order to do a double flare, you can go to your normal auto parts store and they'll likely rent you one for free, really. You're just putting down a deposit to do a double flare. So if you're thinking about building your hot rod on a budget, double flare is more than likely going to be what's best for you. The last part that you're going to have to consider when it comes to your brake system is you're going to be using through chassis fittings or you're going to weld on tabs in order to get your hard lines to transition to soft lines when it comes to the corner of your brake system. Now there's pluses and minuses to both. Let's get into those. So here are the pros and cons when it comes to through chassis fittings. The main pro is that when it comes to bending your actual brake lines, it's much simpler to do so because everything is in line with your massive cylinder. So it usually requires less bends. Here are the cons. Price. You have to pay for not only four extra through chassis fittings, but more than likely now you need to use more T's and more unions in order to attach your brake lines to those fittings. Again, more cost. So if you're trying to build a hot rod on a budget, more than likely, the standard tabs, weld-on tabs, is going to be your option. So let's get into those next. When it comes to the weld-on tabs, this is a totally normal and okay, and actually probably the standard when it comes to building a hot rod and a brake system. And here are the pros and cons. The pros is that it requires a lot less components, which one, that means less money, but also less things that could leak on you in the future. The cons are that normally you can actually see them hanging below your chassis, which is not the end of the world. The real con is that it's gonna require an extra bend or two 
usually speaking, when it comes to getting your brake lines to actually attach to those fittings. So again, pluses and minuses, if you're building something on a budget, nothing wrong with using, again, copper nickel brake lines, inverted flare fittings, and weld on tabs for your brake system. One thing that everybody's gonna agree on is to not interchange or mix your fitting types. If you're gonna run AN fittings, do that. If you're gonna run inverted fittings, do that all the way around. You don't wanna go from an AN to an inverted flare. That's just gonna make one, things really confusing and make your car harder to service or repair in the future. So I think that's it. I hope I didn't miss anything, but if I did, or if you have any questions, feel free to drop a comment below. Reach out to me on my personal page, which is NEA underscore garage, and my business page, which is Cali Rod underscore shop. Thanks everybody for your time, and we'll see you in the next one.